So, so let me yeah. ask you about that. So, so does sure. that mean that so the, the body, in some sense, is reporting to conscious awareness? Now, it reports unconsciously in all sorts of ways, too. So it might report to the hypothalamus, which is a very low-level brain control area, by the way, for those of you who are listening. It might report to the hypothalamus primarily unconsciously. But do you think it's the insula that's reporting on the nature of bodily states to the prefrontal cortex in a manner that allows us to be consciously aware of our body states? That's exactly... Is that part of that integration system? That's exactly right. Exactly right. The insula sits as a different sort of station in that it's reporting to the conscious areas of the brain, to the prefrontal cortex. Right. So we can take them into, we can take our own physiological state into account then when we're envisioning plans, because part of what the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does is allow us to envision different possible futures. And those are plans. And you're not going to make a plan to run two or three blocks to get to the corner store if you're so exhausted you can't get out of bed and you need a reporting mechanism that tells you what physical state you're in so that you can predicate your plans on that. You think the insula, at least in part, is responsible for formulating those those representations or for reporting those representations. That is exactly right. In fact, the animal data and the human data, both lesion data and reversible inactivation data, support that in humans. So you, you have that exactly right. And as you mentioned, the, the prefrontal cortex you know, it gets sort of thrown out there for everything. I think, you know, nowadays people have probably heard of the mm. prefrontal cortex and people hear about executive function, which of course is true. But if we were to really dial back and say, what is the prefrontal cortex in the position to do? It's a flexible rule setting structure. How do we know that? I'm sure you're, you are probably more familiar than I am with the, the classic Stroop task. You know, you give somebody a bunch of cards with different words on them and those words are written in different colors and you tell the person, okay, just read the words to me, ignore the color that they're written in, just read them. And so they're saying they're cat, dog, shelf, book, professor, student, etc. Then you quickly change the rules and you say, you know what? Just tell me the color that the words are written in, but ignore what the words say. And people will do that, but there's a portion of time in which they have, they slow down a bit. It's actually hard because you've done a rule switch. Much of life, as you know, and again, this is more your domain than mine, is about applying different rules in different contexts. Now, what we know is that the insula and the prefrontal cortex are both intimately involved in this conversation that establishes which rules are appropriate for a given situation. So for instance, if somebody were to say something that quote unquote triggers me, okay, I'll use myself as the example, right? Maybe maybe someone will tweet something and I'll think, you know, and I immediately want to respond in a way that I know I can kind of uh, like flip them on their back immediately. But then I think, you know, maybe I want to refrain from that for a number of, any number of different rules or reasons, right? Well, then I have, to, I'm starting to apply different rules. I'm starting to think about the context that's outside of the autonomic response. Because in a strict, very animalistic yeah. way, in other words, in the absence of an insula and a prefrontal cortex conversation, really the only thing an animal or human needs to do is just respond to their arousal in, you know, it's either, you can either retreat, you can stay put, or you can fight, right? That's really the only three three major. And those are very fast responses generally. So let me ask you about the role of the prefrontal cortex in what you described as rule a switching, because I would like to know what you think about whether or not the prefrontal cortex is actually, let's say, switching rules, or if it if what it's doing is switching context-sensitive behavioral patterns that when we talk about, we describe as rules. It is the critical question that you're asking. The prefrontal cortex, in particular, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is in an incredibly unique position to not only establish different rules depending on context. And the way it does that is by accessing memory. So the hippocampus has access to frontal cortex and vice versa. It's almost always a reciprocal conversation. So it can pull memory thinking, oh, you know, the last time I responded like that didn't get me the result I wanted. Or the last time I responded in this other way, I got the result I wanted. Again, regardless of situation. Mm -hmm. The other thing that the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is exquisitely positioned to do, and this is beautiful work of a colleague of mine by the name of Nolan Williams, also in psychiatry is because of its connections to some structures that then feed into the vagus nerve, it actually can slow the heart rate down. So in other words, let's say someone says something and your immediate impulse is to fight or to respond in a kind of knee-jerk way. 
if you halt, right, I guess what the meditators and the mindfulness folks was called the gap, or if you can access some memory mm-hmm. and think, and, and you might be thinking, you know, actually, there's a much better way to place the dart if I just kind of lean back a little bit, or it could be, you know, silence might be the best response, right? Mm-hmm. Or it could be that you're going to carefully access uh, some data from your hippocampus to respond in a way that is most effective. Uh, for instance, here, I'm talking about confrontation, but it could be any situation. The left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does two things. As it acquires a new rule set, or starts to access information about a new or possible rule set, it also sends a parallel signal to slow the heart down through the vagus nerve. And that is, I think, one of the more important and fascinating discoveries in the last five years. That is, those aren't data from my laboratory. I wish they were. But it's very clear that when we start accessing alternate rule sets, there's a signal that quiets the body in some way and position. Is that partly how you calm yourself down? That's right. It is how you calm yourself down. And again, uh, you have the clinical background, not I, but I'll confess I've been in therapy enough to know that occasionally, you know, one feels as if you're accessing some piece of, as the patient side, I can only report from the patient side, you know, Mm -hmm. accessing some, what feels like important piece of information, you're pulling on a thread of some sort, but then the therapist will say something and it literally gives you that alternate view. And this notion of looking at things through a different perspective, we often think about that as a Mm -hmm. switch in our cognitive frame, in our, in our thinking. But also we now know there's this parallel signal that's sent to the body in which in order to access these alternate rule sets, new ways of looking at things, there's a calming signal literally sent to the body as well. And I find this conversation fascinating because normally we just think about anxiety and exploration and rule setting and rule responses or responses to rules, et cetera, as a kind of a, the body sends signals and the brain does all this, what neuroscientists have always talked about as top down processing, right? Just sort of suppress the hypothalamus, control the limbic system. Right, right. And that's true to some extent, but there's also, it's clear there are signals being sent to the body in parallel. And rather than look at the signals, it's more like conducting than suppressing. Exactly. Like conducting like an organ orchestra, orchestrator conducts. Exactly. And there's a very interesting Mm -hmm. phenomenon that takes place in people that have chronic anxiety or for people who essentially stop accessing alternate rules and responses to these signals. And this is, I think, what is showing up in chronic anxiety, certainly in certain forms of depression. And when people enter states of rage and dysregulation is that normally we know based on neuroimaging that the prefrontal cortex is essentially leading the response of the of this anterior cingulate cortex in the insula. So information is coming up from the body into the insula and then being fed to the prefrontal cortex. But then the prefrontal cortex is actually in a position to lead responses. And it essentially is acting like the coach of a team. And the team is all these structures like the ACC and the the anterior cingulate Mm -hmm. cortex in the insula, Mm -hmm. the heart rate and so forth. Mm -hmm. What happens in individuals who have chronic anxiety or damage to the prefrontal cortex or dysregulation of these circuitries is that order actually reverses the insula and ACC start leading and directing the response of the prefrontal cortex. And I think, you know, we see this in, I'm sure you've seen this clinically in individuals. And while this isn't necessarily a discussion about society at large, I mean, we see this in dysregulated arguments and dysregulated combat where people is essentially losing themselves and they default to one, what appears to be very primitive rule set. And it may or may not be the appropriate one, but you and I, of course, have the good fortune of knowing a number of people who've worked in special operations and things like that. And you talk to any of those individuals and they know from experience and from training that their ability to access multiple rule sets and options in the moments of extreme autonomic arousal is actually where their power lies.